Welcome to another episode of Critical Conversations, where we talk about hot topic issues related to American Muslims and other targeted communities. Today we are joined by Melissa Giroux and Andrew Grant Thomas, who are co-founders of Embrace Race. Embrace Race is a national organization based here in Amherst, Massachusetts. It is made up of a multiracial community of parents, educators, and caregivers who produce and share resources on having conversations, constructive conversations around race and race relations, in particular with children. Melissa and Andrew, thank you both so much for being here. Thanks for having us. Great for being here, Fabi. Great. Malika. So we, I think, would like love to begin to sort of hear about your personal respective backgrounds. Mm -hmm and how it was growing up around race for you. What was mm -hmm. your personal experiences around that? Sure. So Melissa, let's begin yeah, with you. Yeah, so I grew up um, in the United States mm -hmm. with immigrant parents. Uh, my mother's French Canadian, my father's from uh, Dominican from the island of Dominica, mm -hmm. which is not the Dominican Republic. <laughs> and um, and we <coughs> were a mixed race family. You know, we are a mixed race family and um, I grew up in actually in Springfield in the North End in a Puerto Rican neighborhood and had kind of a mixed race, mixed class, uh, mixed schooling experience mm -hmm. and was just very aware. I think people who hang out at the intersections, you know, between um, sort of cultures or um, who are both, who are both maybe racially as well. Um, I just saw a lot and experienced a lot and um, was just very aware that things were different, um, that there was a racial hierarchy mm -hmm. and that people were treated, that it was unjust and that people were treated differently because of it. And I was also aware of my own pr privilege as a light skinned person and how that operated, um, in social situations, depending on whom I was with and where I was. And, um, as I became an adult and changed environments, it, um, yeah, it was a, it was a shield for me and, uh, but was something that I was concerned about and wanted to talk, speak out about pretty early. Sure. Yeah. And so did you personally have any experiences around race and racism? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, absolutely. You know, um, just a feeling of, you know, we had, we had, there are so many experiences I'm trying to f figure out what to tell you, but there's one that I you know, tell, have told about um, being my nickname when I was in elementary school because I went to school, to, to a Catholic school that mm -hmm. was mostly white. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had a little carpool of those of us coming from my neighborhood. And my nickname very young among really friends was um, N the N-word, N-lips. Wow. Um, so that was something, you know, that really has helped me. I tell that story because it really... My response to it was quite interesting that uh, it really hurt me and it made me feel less than, sure. but I didn't tell my parents. You and know, why is that? Yeah, because, um, you know, my parents, uh, because we weren't talking about race per se at home. Mm -hmm. We were talking about, I certainly had, a you know, um, great examples of their friendship circles mm -hmm. and their, our family was very multiracial, sure. but it still wasn't something we spoke about. It was more something we thought Americans did. Like mm. Americans had this black and white thing yes. and we were sort of watching it and sometimes we were caught up in it, but actually it was more about them. And I think my parents didn't understand that. And it's a, a problem I see a lot of and talk to a lot of immigrant parents who yes. just say, I don't know what to do. It's so different here yes. that they didn't have the tools. They didn't have the language to give me and they weren't getting it from, and I wasn't getting it from the schools right. or from Americans sure. because Americans had decided not to talk about it right. as well. Oh, absolutely. Wow. That's right. Yeah. So I think the reason I didn't tell them is that I felt really ashamed sure. and embarrassed and, I didn't, and, embarrassed and I didn't want to bring that on them. I mm. wanted to be, um, you know, a, a good kid right? and right. this was sort of proof that I wasn't. You know? Wow, absolutely. And I feel like I'm an immigrant parent myself and, you know, having grown up in Pakistan and came here as an adult, um, I also find that, you know, when you come from a, uh, like I came from a Muslim majority country and so you walk the world with a certain amount of confidence. Having been part of the majority 
uh, you know, large part of your early life, there's a certain confidence that you have. And, and I feel that sometimes our children who are then born and raised here, one, sometimes immigrant parents can't completely relate to their experiences growing up as racial or religious exactly. minorities. And so I think there is that gap that needs to be addressed. And right. so thank you for sharing yeah. that. Mm -hmm. um, Andrew, what about you? What were your experiences growing up? <coughs> well, definitely some resonance with what, what you just said and uh, certainly a lot of what Melissa said too. So. You know, uh, I was born in Jamaica, mm -hmm. came when I was seven to this country of Jamaican parents, right? Black Jamaican parents. Jamaica is an island in that has roughly 90% black identified, right? Not to say there aren't race issues and certainly color issues, sure. uh, very definitely class issues, mm -hmm. uh, but it's very different. Or it's a very different setting. So for my parents, you know, in the mid 70s to come to the US and to New Haven, Connecticut, uh, which uh, at the time especially had a large black population, a larger white population, mm -hmm. lots of class issues. Mm -hmm. And they experienced a lot of stuff, wow. you know, a lot of stuff, which on one hand was, uh, I think, sort of bewildering mm -hmm. uh, to them, um, offensive to them. Sure. You know, they, um, my mom in particular came from some class privilege, mm -hmm. right, in Jamaica. So, uh, so no, that, that, you know, the roots of this work for us are very personal as well as professional, uh, and then we became parents. But yes, the, f the first the first sort of pillar of it was established pretty early in childhood. Right, by your own experiences. Absolutely. So then what led you to actually begin Embrace Race? What was a, a gap or a need that you were trying to address? Mm -hmm. And also, what are some of the resources that you share and what is the programming that you do? So we discovered early on when we had our own kids, you know, I think, having your own kids is such a great window into, you know, it's a moment when you're open again mm. to things that you had stuffed down, experiences that you um, maybe had looked at but had put in the past. And when you see your kids experiencing similar things or being, uh, you know, raising them in a place that um, still where, you know, whiteness is still supreme, sure. right, in everything, in the, n in the media, in, um, government and you know all of it sure. um, and not just whiteness you sure. know but uh, patriarchy is a, a huge deal as well but sure. when you see all that you sort of go oh no what do we do and so we had a group of friends um, and uh, some work we were doing at a school in Amherst mm -hmm. uh, our daughter's preschool and we started with them a, a race and parenting just a little group so that we could talk about things mm -hmm. and in in um, starting that group, we realized that there really weren't resources for parents. You know, we um, have some professional experience dealing with race and equity issues, yeah. but a lot of the um, articles were really academic, mm -hmm. and the more general articles in newspapers and that kind of thing were really geared towards uh, families with white children. They weren't really geared towards families with kids in targeted groups. I see. Um, so those, those were the that's really how we started. We realized that we needed to co a place to collect those resources sure. and to have even broader conversations um, across the U.S. ultimately, yeah, Wonderful. and even internationally. And so is this an online platform uh, primarily, and um, w in what kinds of resources do you share, and where can people find these re resources for our audience? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it, it, we're definitely mostly online. Mm -hmm. Let me come back to that just one moment. I wanted yes. to say a little bit about the gaps. You have asked yes, a question please. about gaps, and Melissa certainly spoke to some of that, but I think it's really important to appreciate sort of the scope of this, mm -hmm. not just our work, Embrace Race work, but the, the importance of engaging these issues in a really robust way. So yes, it's about right, the gap that uh, parents find, uh, parents who know that race and identity matters and want to you know, prepare their children not only to be acted on in the world and respond to that, but to act in the world, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and that's true, of course, for children of color as well as white children. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, most of the resources available are for educators, right? right? Middle and high school educators, as Melissa said. Not our resources. Yeah. No, no, sorry. Most of the resources that were that were already out there, uh -huh. right? Most of the organizations doing this work in this space yes. are preparing resources for educators, really not for parents, not for grandparents, right. not for pediatricians, not for the majority of adults who engage children in some way. Right, so a huge gap, right? Huge <laughs> gap. Um, 
And also, you know, for me, especially coming out of r racial justice work, mm -hmm. you know, I've done a lot of research and advocacy around race. Mm -hmm. uh, I think this is one, and there's, you know, huge amount of really important, indispensable work happening. And I think a huge gap is here, right? How do we prepare our children? How do we prepare children who can be, um, you know, citizens in a multiracial democracy? Absolutely. Right, the yeah. community members a multiracial democracy mm -hmm. needs. Uh, so far, you know, we could be doing a lot better, and the challenge will only grow as our demographics change. Uh, so yeah. do you want to say a, a bit about the, uh, the resources? Because you had asked the question yeah. about resources. Yeah. I don't yeah. want to keep dominating. No, no, no. <laughs> you're, you're, so yeah, I, I, I appreciate what you just said. And, and one of the things that we realize in um, the research is that a lo oftentimes um, in the mainstream media, um, things are framed as black and white. Yeah. And in fact, um, if you look at segregation and who our friend groups are, mm -hmm. you know, as parents, you know, and that has an effect on our kids, we're often very segregated sure. as groups of color as mm -hmm. well, right? So, yeah, so it's not only, as Andrew said, we're concerned about how our kids are acted upon, but also how they act on people mm -hmm. unlike them, Absolutely. right? Because they um, have different privileges as well, and they're, um, they're able to, yeah, they're able to sort of do harm um, or to understand better and to know better. So that those are the two concerns. So the way that we do that with resources is we have uh, monthly conversations. We try to bring up, to sort of create and to curate um, resources that, uh, you know, speak to, the, to, to the, this race and parent parenting issue. And um, we get them from lots of different people because it's such a huge area that we couldn't possibly sure. do it ourselves. Yeah. So we bring in the expertise, we bring in the experience, we have uh, monthly conversations that anyone can join online, they're free. Uh, we create webinars. webinars. Yeah. Uh, we're moving to podcasts soon. Yeah. Um, we have these uh, tip sheets where the, the experts and people of experience that come on, um, including ourselves, um, create sort of the takeaways, the best practices, what yeah. you do, sort of an action guide, what you do in your home with your kids. And we are present on social media trying to keep the conversation sort of alive um, as, as things come up every sure. day. Um, we post a lot and have discussions about uh, racial issues that are very live. And, and we have a lot of other programming of we coming up. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and you have a, a, w a really vibrant <coughs> Facebook page with thousands and thousands of followers and yes. everybody's sharing these amazing, amazing, you know, articles and just the latest research and yeah. all of that is really important. So I really encourage our viewers to actually visit your Facebook page and also embracerace.org, which is the address for your website, which is really amazing. So I'd like to sort of shift gears just a little bit and sort of talk about some of the themes that you actually grapple with. Mm -hmm. um, and you have pointed out that children notice race, mm -hmm. even if most adults don't think that they do, and that it is our responsibility as parents, as educators, to sort of create the, that space um, and create opportunities for them to have those conversations around race. So can you give an example of how that can be done and how do you begin to have such a conversation? Sure, so let me offer two. Mm -hmm. So one very generally is with books, mm -hmm. right? At the earliest ages, I mean, you know, there's a, a lot of work around books as windows and mirrors, mm -hmm. right? Mirrors for the child, where hopefully the child is able to see themselves. Uh, and and windows into the world of other children that they may not be familiar with. Mm -hmm. So Melissa mentioned segregation, yes, social segregation, residential segregation, segregation in school. The point is, you know, we have 330 million people in this country, right. however many million children, and by and large, children grow up with uh, and certainly are in the home with people who look like themselves, right. both other children, right? So they don't have you know, we have, you know, structured our lives collectively in such a way that they don't have access to each other, right. which makes them much more vulnerable to whatever impressions, sure. right, there sure. might be out there right. from their friends, from school, from Hollywood, from whatever the source. Yeah. Uh, so, you now a big, so books, though, are a way, and frankly, a relatively safe way, mm -hmm. right? It's harder to reach out and actually connect with another human being. Yeah. It's harder to, uh, sometimes it feels like you're taking a chance, 
but you know you can go to the library you can go to the bookstore you can pick up a book for your child and that at least gives a partial mm -hmm. right bridge to other communities and hopefully a bridge to seeing yourself and your own possibilities if you're a child sure so you said books and was there another one that you wanted to mention sure there you know and then i mean and then i think about really organic opportunities mm -hmm. right because yes as you say children see race all the time they notice what they don't what they don't have is a way of making sense of it yes right and you know melissa likes to talk about and i, I love uh, sort of this way of thinking about it that there is a conversation that's happening yeah right all the time right Th that your your child is part of the audience yeah. for uh -huh. um the question is are you you know as a mom as a dad as a grandparent as a teacher are you going to help them make sense of that mm -hmm. right so again mm -hmm. they they notice patterns they're driving in the car you know, let's say in Boston, yeah. right? Uh, two hours away, very segregated city. Same is true of Philadelphia, Washington DC, of New York, of any number of places. So you drive through neighborhoods and oh, I look out the window and all the people here are black, yeah. right? All the people in this neighborhood are white, all the kids in my school or in my class in school and mm. otherwise, you know? So they notice these patterns, you know, who's dating whom, who's you know, on what team and mm -hmm. what club. Who has yeah. power. Who has power. Who has the oh. nice when houses. When I look on television, yeah. Yeah, right? Absolutely. Who do I see when they pan the Senate floor? Right. Yeah. Right? So right. the question, so they notice all these things. The question is, how do they make sense of them? Yeah. That's where the action is. That's where we can help. Yeah. Absolutely. And I also feel, I mean, especially here in this country, and I find that that's very different from how it was in Pakistan, that, you know, there is this, you know, great emphasis on being very polite in public spaces. Mm -hmm. So if a child is out grocery shopping, you know, a young child, say a three or four year old mm -hmm. with their parent, and if they notice somebody who looks different from them, and if they point to that difference, the immediate response of the parent is, shh, mm -hmm. you know, we'll talk about it later, or shh, don't say that. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a in an immediate sort of conversation squasher right mm -hmm. there. And I no think like we then lose an opportunity, not to maybe then have that conversation, but at a later stage back home to have that conversation and talk about those differences. Right. Um, and I think, um, Melissa, you had once mentioned elsewhere about the need, you know, just to give children uh, drawing paper and crayons and mm -hmm. ask them to draw what they see around the table with mm -hmm. children of different mm -hmm races, different ethnic backgrounds, because that can also be a conversation starter. Yeah, yeah. well, I think that um, the funny thing about what you say about not mentioning it, I remember various times, even up through uh, as an adult, people not knowing my background and saying like, are you, are you, you know, just looking <laughs> at me and trying to figure it out and then saying, oh, no, no, forget it. I remember this in college, even yeah. a friend was, oh, uh, forget it, yeah. an early friend. and. I, what I took from that is, oh, they don't want to ask me if I'm black. Like, yes, that's, as if there's something, wrong, if something, something wrong, wrong with that. You know, and so yes. that signals to me, oh, they think there's something wrong with that. Yes. And that creates a real schism, right? Yeah. So, um, so I think talking about it's important. I did, it's very, it's kind of like uh, talking about race is like talking about many other things that you mm -hmm. do as a parent. Or, or, uh, and the way is to start very early and to sit on the floor with your kid and ask them what they observe, mm -hmm. right? Um, skin color crayons are a great way to um, have a conversation and draw each other or draw other people. Mm -hmm. When you're reading books, a lot of parents think, oh, I should just read books. Yeah. And they don't actually realize that the book is a starting point for a conversation. The book alone is not going to teach your kid about yeah. race, right? Sure. It'll teach them some things, but not necessarily what you want mm -hmm. them to get out of it because they're using kid logic and they're combining all of this other stuff, right? They're bringing, they're bringing a context to the book. Yeah. So you can do things like talk about very early, give them the, the building block vocabulary of talking about skin color. What do you notice? Um, oh, her skin is a little bit browner than yours. This one's a little bit more of a, you know, vanilla. This one's, a bit, you know, just really having those words. And the skin color crayons can actually be the words you use as well. Yeah. I remember my daughter coming home early in kindergarten. They had all the kids draw each kid. This is an Amherst. It was such a great exercise. And ask them, interview them, f the five, five similar questions like, uh, what do you like to eat and that kind of thing. And each kid had to had skin color crayons and had to look at my daughter and say, uh, and try to figure out what skin color. And she got to decide. So she looked and said, oh, I'm burnt sienna. And so um, everyone drew her in burnt sienna. Wow. And they really looked at her. Yes. They really saw her and heard right. her. And 
she came home and said that and I was really thrilled because the message the teacher didn't have to say it's okay to talk about skin color she just did it they right. just had that conversation and it was right? very experiential yeah. and it made it very natural for them right. to have that conversation right. and, and, and you can do that with books as well like oh what do you notice and if they don't talk about race say uh, or skin color say I notice sure I noticed that they're wearing different color clothes and all these things that you've mentioned, but no one's talked about this other thing I noticed. I noticed their skin color's different. Do you notice that? Mm. Oh yeah, that person did it because sometimes kids need permission because yes. they've learned not to talk. Not to talk about it, yeah. And we're talking about, right, so that's that's a the beginning of the conversation, yeah. right, mm -hmm. with very young children. That's certainly, mm -hmm. I think, the right place to start. And <coughs> you know, it's important for us to talk to children about how race operates at at least two levels, mm -hmm. right? So there's this sort of physical stuff, yes. the phenotypical stuff, and that's mm -hmm. where we start. And then, but the real heart of the matter is why, is that, why does that matter, mm, right? Sure. And it matters because the visible stuff, you know, the skin color, the hair texture, all of this, and eye shape, all of that, is taken by, uh, by, by all of us to mean something, right? Yeah to signal these invisible things, mm -hmm. right? Like, oh, who's really good at math? Who's really, you know, athletic? You know, who's really good at music, at language, at leading other people, um, at, at following other people, right? Yeah. At being physical, I mean, all of these, this wide range. And, and the real challenge, I think, becomes, you know, why, why do we have that connection, right? Let's talk to our children about why people think that these things you can see signal these things that you can't see and what difference does that make and those connections aren't always very positive oh they're very a and that's when it becomes yeah. pernicious when right. that when those differences become pernicious and yeah. you actually are touching on a really hugely important mm -hmm. thing which is they are both yeah right mm -hmm. there's always a flip side mm -hmm. right so this is where you know we talk about yes we we often talk about marginalization and people of color as if the whole race story was a people of color story, right? <laughs> yes. Let's talk about black people, let's talk about Latinx people, we should do that. But let's talk about why we believe these things. Let's talk about you know, why our schools work in a way that systematically disadvantage those groups of people. But the flip side is it advantages some, yeah. right? It's not just about disadvantage. And, and you know, changing things and holding people accountable means seeing that full picture. Absolutely, absolutely. And I'd like to sort of continue on this sort of theme about the role of educators and their role in sort of facilitating these conversations. And Andrew, I know that you recently wrote an article in which you mentioned a middle school teacher in Florida who gave her sixth graders an assignment in which they were asked to consider how they feel about certain groups of people. And um, some of the groups that she mentioned were, you know, you are, your new roommate is a Palestinian and Muslim. A group of young black men are walking towards you on the street. Um, you are assigned a lab partner who is a fundamentalist Christian. You're sitting next to a young man on an airplane who is an Arab. So those were the groups of some of the groups of people that she had mentioned in the assignment. There was a huge uproar in the community and there was a lot of outrage by parents who felt that their children should not be grappling with these issues and that teacher was subsequently fired. Um, what do you think of that particular assignment as a way to start a conversation and what do you think about the response of the school administration in sort of firing her? Yeah, so two thoughts. I'd love to hear what Melissa mm -hmm. thinks about this. A couple of quick thoughts. One is on one hand, the subject matter clearly, right? We are embrace race. We're having these conversations all the time, trying to support people, including ourselves, to have them effectively. Uh, so the basic idea of engaging this issue of race, ethnicity, all those identities, yeah. right, sort of invoked in, in the teacher's example, that topic, that subject, that space needs to be explored. There is a real question about yeah, is this the starting, right? Is there, is, was there any scaffolding mm. in place? You know, we're talking about sixth graders. Yeah. That's 11, 12 years old. Uh, certainly, if this is literally the first time mm. there's been an explicit conversation around sure. these issues, that could be very upsetting. Uh, children may not know what to do with that information. Right. Certainly by sixth grade, they've learned what we were talking about earlier, that you, you shouldn't talk about these things, yeah. that it's taboo, it feels wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, so if literally that's the first time they're having the conversation, probably that's not the place to begin. Mm -hmm. uh, a quick word on the administration and the parents, right, who many of whom said, you know, essentially, we don't want our children exposed to this stuff. Yeah. 
that's also deeply problematic, right? And again, this is what we're responding to uh, with Embrace Race. Your children are exposed already, yeah. right? Not explicitly, mm -hmm. but nevertheless powerfully. Sure. Uh, and, and I think this teacher was trying to, uh, was surely coming from a good place. Maybe this isn't the, the, the point of departure that mm -hmm. she might have used. Yeah, and I feel like, you know, again, sort of talking about this particular teacher, and we don't know whether there was some introduction to this whole topic before she went into this That's exercise. Right. And I feel like oftentimes, you know, as t just teachers are feeling like they're ill-equipped to handle some right. of these questions. As a Muslim parent, I was very concerned about how 9-11 was being mm -hmm. taught in social studies classes or you know in middle schools and high schools just sort of not knowing whether that would actually perpetuate division or if it was being done in a more sensitive way and i reached out to one of my kids teachers social studies and he said i wish we had the training mm. to be able to grapple with this topic which is huge and he said but we have none and i would love to have that training so that we are able to sort of approach it more sensitively but uh, melissa would you like to add on to that yeah um i would say that um, you can't just throw a kid into the pool and expect them to swim. I mean, I guess there's that, that is debatable because some little babies <laughs> swim immediately. But uh, I was at the pool with my daughter who had trouble swimming and a little one-year-old just jumped right in and we were, <laughs> we were quite embarrassed. But, um, but usually that analogy holds that, um, I mean, even listening to those examples and thinking about we have a sixth grader who has been having this conversation for so long, you know, that she would get yeah. She would understand that uh, what was being said there and why it's probably, you know, why there's stereotypes being evoked mm -hmm. or um, that um, you do need to talk about and dismiss. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I, part of it is that, yeah, no one has, teachers don't have the training. Teachers are expected to have the training when, in fact, a lot of the parents who come in and are complaining and got that teacher fired don't have the training either. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? There's right. sort of a, it's a context in which we're being, in which these are really um, have been have become hard issues to talk about, yeah. and there's a lot of resistance to talking about it. So that's the context in which any brave teacher is trying to teach. So I think, in part, parents we need to, and that's part of why we're doing Embrace Race is it's our responsibility too. We can't right. abdicate our responsibility to, you know, the schools. Um, and I guess another way, uh, going back to our earlier <coughs> conversation about how to talk to kids about mm -hmm. this, how to ladder up to these conversations, mm -hmm. um, early when you're talking about phenotype, right, yeah. and valuing and saying, oh, look at this kid has a pretty brown face, or just showing the, that you value, right, yeah. and that you value difference, um, if that's different for you or whatever difference. Um, besides doing that, you need to talk about what's fair mm -hmm. and what's unfair. And kids yeah. are really tuned into that, whether it's, you know, so-and-so got an extra cookie. Like, they really feel, young kids, the unfair fair. And you can, again, with books or with uh, situations that happen in the classroom, talk about, um, you know, situations. A lot of people will read their race book will be about MLK, mm -hmm. and and you'll hear about all of the unfairness that yeah. MLK and many other people, of course, were pushing back against. And kids learn those lessons very early, um, and can apply those. You know, if you're using the language fair unfair, yeah. can apply those to other situations and just learn to have the conversation. What are they feeling? What is confusing? Um, what do they think is fair or unfair? Yeah. How would you, have you ever been treated differently because, you know, you look different or because your parents look different or because you live in a different place? These are all, you know, similarities that yeah. and differences that we can talk about uh, to build empathy. I wonder if I could pull back for a moment. Yes. Um, <coughs> just thinking about you know, half of public school children in this country, right, right now mm -hmm. are children of color. Yes. Right? They're black and Latinx and Asian American, et cetera. Yeah. That will only grow. Yes. Right? The, what we're talking about, uh, and I just have to sort of emphasize the stakes for folks, what we're talking about, right, how they understand the world, how they understand each other, uh, will shape, has already shaped, not with the children, but with us, right, their parents, their grandparents, the cr what the criminal justice system looks like, exactly. what housing markets look like, what the economy looks like, what the military looks like, how it performs, all of those things, and that will continue to be true, 
right? It would, in fact, will be the, the role of people of color will only grow as the number and, uh, and contributions, et cetera, of people of color grow. Right. If we do not help these children now, that, that there would be a class of sixth graders mm -hmm. in Florida, of all places, which incidentally, Florida has almost exactly the, the um, racial demographic profile of the country as a whole. Oh, wow. Florida right now is the United States in terms of racial demographics. Oh, wow. That sixth graders, right, would have, um, you know, that that might well have been the first sort of explicit exposure in school and clearly judging from the reaction of the parents at home, you know, and that this, this teacher might well have not had the support yeah. she needed you know, to do this, you know, perhaps better than she did, and we don't know enough information to judge, is a, is, is a national tragedy, right? It is right. emblematic of what's happening across the country, and we are, we are paying the consequences right now, and we'll continue to pay the consequences. So this is not a small parochial issue. It's mm -hmm. huge, and as you said, it's going to get bigger as, you know, uh, the demographic changes that we're experiencing in this country as a whole, as that is going to grow, um, you know, that's going to become even more critical. And, you know, I was so struck by this recent, well, it wasn't a recent survey, it was about, um, from about six years ago, um, and it was done of, uh, of young people between the ages of 14 and 24. And they were asked um, just different questions about race and race relations, and 48% of them felt that it was wrong to um, sort of even draw attention to somebody who was different from them, even if it was done in a positive way. Mm -hmm. And while 94% had seen bias around them, only 20% were comfortable having a conversation about that because the ones who were not comfortable said that we feel if we have those conversations, it's just going to make the situation worse. We will offend somebody. So how do you then create that space when there is such, you know, um, I don't want to use the word, uh, this is so much fear and concern around sort of saying the wrong thing. If you have this conversation, I don't feel like there, those, there are enough safe spaces yeah. where people feel, even adults, having those conversations where yeah. they will be branded either as racist if they say the wrong mm -hmm. thing or if they ask the wrong question. Right. Um, so I feel like that is just, I feel like a cultural thing nationally that I see a lot happening. And I feel like that also stifles some of these conversations. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a really, Great point, and I, I've, in the school context, I wish what had happened in that case with that teacher, I wish that parents had come in and said, and talked about what upset them, and sort of worked elbow to elbow with the teacher and the administration and had mm, a discussion, right. right? Because those are the those are the hard conversations that we need to have, and the big feelings and all that, yeah. that we are gonna, are inevitable yeah. when we say we're, we need to talk about this. You know, it makes all of that, um, it makes all of that happen. So, uh, but the, yeah, the real issue is that if we can't, there's sort of an orthodoxy about getting it right. And the truth is that Andrew and I don't always get it right. I mean, I hope that's not surprising. <laughs> um, Especially but, Melissa, yeah. really doesn't get it right. But really, like, we, c we thought about having a show called Microaggressions that I've committed, you know? Mm -hmm because we yeah. do, you know? Yes. And so we need to have, we need to be comfortable enough. There's some idea, and sometimes people who do this work perpetuate the idea that they have the answer, mm -hmm. you know, that they know how to talk about it. It's always wrong to X, Y, Z. Yeah. And I think we need to try to try to be less orthodox about those things and really have the conversations and, and do some work on, you live in this country, you live in this world, you're getting these messages that are racialized all the time and that hierarchize people and yeah. make it make us more comfortable than we should be with a lot of stuff that's happening in the US. You know, right. why is it okay to give some kids subpar education because they're kids of color? Right. You know, why is right. it okay to um, imprison some kids at the border? Why yeah. is it a kid to okay to ban kids, right? right. So, so so there's this comfort we have that makes all of us um, and I'm not saying we're totally comfortable but we all need to examine sort of our own, how we perpetuate, yes. you know, how we're part of the problem and how we can um, ameliorate the problem, how we can right. work against it. Absolutely, you know, examine our own implicit biases. I mean, yeah. the good news is that the, the kinds of phenomena, kind of developments, right, kids in cages, you know, the state of public education, all of these things, 
um, you know, the, the racial turbulence, right, that of our times, which have become really explicit. Yes. Certainly starting with Obama and, you know, Black Lives Matter and mm -hmm. Dream Defenders and, you know, escalating uh, under the current administration. I mean, that's actually opened up some opportunity yeah. for a lot of people, mm -hmm. right? So the first thing we need to do is, as they say, acknowledge that you have a problem yes. and that we need to talk about it. Right. And I do think more and more people, we're certainly seeing that in our work, more and more people are coming and saying, you know what? Um, yeah, I was, we literally have a friend here and a white mom, middle-aged mom, three white children who said, you know what, I was one of those people when Obama was elected who thought, good, we're done, wow. right? This race yeah. journey is over. Yeah. And she said, my jaw dropped over the next two, four, eight years sure. of the backlash against, right? Mm -hmm. And she said, I, I want to make sure that my children grow up more informed, more thoughtful. Yes than I was, than I had opportunity to be when I was a kid, but I don't know what to do, because I, I can't make sense of it myself, right, right? right? I'm completely bewildered by what's going on. That's an opportunity though, right? right. And this moment is affording mm -hmm. that opportunity, and yes, we're trying to uh, step into it with more and more people. Right, and it is absolutely a moment of reckoning, I think, for this entire, for all of us and the entire country. And yes, it's terrible to see the social and political climate that we're living in where, you know, communities of color are so explicitly targeted, not just by segments of society, but by people in power, by our leadership. And, um, and it's so hard to sort of build resilience around that. But it has, as you said, created this opportunity where we do have some space to then have those conversations that all is not well with the world and we really need to do some very hard work. And both of you are at the forefront of that here in our community and I'm so grateful for what you provided Embrace Race. I wish we could continue the conversation. Unfortunately, we're out of time, but I will encourage our audience to please visit their website, embracerace.org. Also visit their Facebook page. You will learn a lot as I have. So thank you both so much for joining us. Can I just say very quickly, yeah. we're huge fans of your work. You're <laughs> clearly yeah. Critical Connections that's doing this work thank as you well, so having much. incredibly important conversations. Thank you. I appreciate it. And I hope we'll have lots of opportunities to collaborate as well. That would be awesome. Thank you both so much. And until next time, this is your host, Mehlaka Sandani.